Mark Conrad is, uh, is a, a physician who's chaired the Ethics Committee at Shepherd Pratt for over 20 years. And uh, he is uh, on the teaching faculty of John oh Hopkins gosh. University of Maryland and Tulane. He's a member of the APA Assembly, the, the, the American Psychiatric Association Assembly, and previously served six years on their Ethics Committee in these capacities. He's helped craft and pass APA position resolutions, uh, such as the one in December of 20. Uh, 16 that says a psychiatrist should not prescribe or, or administer any intervention to a non-terminal Ill person for the purpose of of causing death. I'm letting people in as we go, as you see. He's consulted throughout the U.S., Canada, Sc Scan Scandinavia, New Zealand, Australia, Brazil, arguing to policymakers and physicians that assisted suicide and euthanasia is neither good public policy nor good ethics or medicine. He also spoke in Belgium and he's been in the Netherlands and he's uh, and been involved with this issue now for several years and become a worldwide leader. Dr. Conrad spends most of his time treating psychiatric conditions. He has a special interest in helping families convince a troubled uh, loved one to get a psychiatric consultation. He lectures and give work, gives workshops on these ideas, uh, on the, this to on mental health advocacy and support organizations throughout the country, well, actually in Canada too. For this work, he was given the NAMI Exemplary Psychiatrist Award and is a mental health professional and uh, was the Mental Health Professional of the Year. He has also hosted, uh, been the host of a national radio call and show, Comrade on Call, which broadcasted to 43 million listeners throughout the US. He was a regular, he's a regular psychiatrist on medical talk shows and he's aired on NPR and he continues to appear regularly on TV, radio, podcasts to discuss topics in psychiatry, including with the Euthanasia Prevention Coalition. Now, many of you might be wondering why we have invited Dr. Conrad uh, to speak, knowing that most of the audience, not all the audience, is uh, Canadian. Well, this uh, topic of euthanasia for psychiatric reasons and uh, euthanasia for people with mental illness is uh, right now, sadly, a key topic that's being debated in Canada. It's, they say that in Bill C-7, the current legislation, that euthanasia for mental illness is not allowed, but in, in fact, that's questionable. Nonetheless, uh, I think this presentation from uh, such a leading psychiatrist and ethicist will pro provide you lots of great information, but on top of it, help us understand uh, completely why euthanasia should never be for people who have these psychiatric conditions, why psychiatrists should not participate. Uh, I should now let Dr. Conrad begin. Well, thank you very much. And uh, Alex, can you hear me okay? I can hear you okay, yes. Uh, right. Is your volume up? Fine? Thank you so much for inviting me. I really appreciate an opportunity to be with you all again. I've spoken uh, for and with the EPC before, uh, and I think that you all are some of the most important advocates uh, and activists, frankly, on this issue in the world. And Really, I myself, as you've heard, am a clinician, I'm a practicing psychiatrist, so most of my time is spent with patients, but I'm also a psychiatric ethicist. Uh, mm -hmm. And I teach uh, medical ethics uh, through, really throughout the country and consult and I write. And uh, this particular issue that we're talking about tonight, the physician-assisted suicide and euthanasia, is one that has actually, uh, to be honest, transformed me over the course of the last several years uh, from being an ethicist really into an activist, maybe for the first time in my life, uh, simply because having discovered that indeed there are places that uh, have been making psychiatric patients eligible for euthanasia and a physician-assisted suicide and those like Canada that may indeed be on the verge of such developments really ran the flag up my pole uh, and has resulted in my passion mounting towards going around the world, trying to explain why as somebody who's treated psychiatric patients for 35 years uh, and uh, taught and consulted with uh, ethical issues, why I feel this is neither good public policy nor good medical ethics. So I want to share some of those thoughts with you uh, this evening. You know, we're all in a very uh, dark time now, particularly here in the United States, uh, several things that we're going through. And 
this topic seems to fit those dark times. Uh, I really want to begin with uh, Melville's famous quote, uh, woe to him who seeks to please rather than to appall. Well, indeed, uh, unfortunately, my role tonight is not to please you, it is to appall you and to share with you that same sense of being appalled that really uh, sent me up the flagpole on this particular issue and why. So this is our uh, agenda tonight. I'm gonna to start by talking about some aspects of language, the vicissitudes of language, which in controversies like this is uh, most important because uh, uh, who owns the language uh, may also uh, own the, the logic here as well. And so there's a battle over language. Then I'm gonna show you data pertinent to our topic tonight about assisted suicide and euthanasia in general, but especially uh, psychiatric dimension of that in the United States, in Canada, where most of the uh, audience tonight is from, and particularly uh, data from the living laboratories of the Netherlands and Belgium that have been act these activities now uh, for uh, nearly 18 years. And then finally, we'll bring all this data into focus by talking about some of the value issues, uh, some aspects of medical ethics, some clinical considerations in order to support my thesis, psychiatrists should not be participating in these procedures. So as you know, as I've said, I'm a clinician and an ethicist and the intersection between philosophy uh, and uh, psychiatry really is in the topic of suicide. Camus famously said, there is but one truly serious philosophical problem and that is suicide. Uh, and he also said to misname things adds to the world's misery. Well, I think that there is great danger of things being misnamed, misnamed uh, by virtue of the fluidity of language. As Humpty Dumpty said in Alice in Wonderland, a word means what I want it to mean. Nothing more, nothing less. Well, in fact, uh, the definition of suicide is something that is being bent, uh, that is being distorted the common sense definition of suicide, the definition of suicide that we in ordinary clinical practice in the trenches of treating psychiatric patients have utilized uh, really since uh, the dawn of medicine, let alone psychiatry, uh, and in indeed in everyday practice and research. This is a definition by the American Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, uh, one of our leading uh, public health organizations, and simply defines suicide as death caused by self-directed behavior with an intent to die. And I really wanna be clear that I really think that it is most important for us to own that word, to embrace the common sense definition of suicide despite attempts to change that such as from the American Association of Suicidology, which in February of 2018 said legal physician assisted deaths should not be considered cases of suicide. Now, though this association may want to disassociate itself from that uh, word, I, I will tell you that as a psychiatrist, and uh, most of my colleagues would agree with me, that uh, physician-assisted suicide is no less suicide uh, than other forms, whether you choose to call it made, made medical assistance in dying, or uh, uh, facilitated death, or whatever you choose to call it, we are still talking about suicide. As Orwell said, if thought can corrupt language, language can corrupt thought. And it's why we need to sustain uh, our understanding of this common sense use of the word. Do you remember from his book, 1984, the slogans of the government, war is peace, freedom is slavery, ignorance is strength, we don't wanna start adding to that things like providing suicide as treatment or euthanasia is palliative care. This guy, Job, uh, Rob Jean Quier, who's a physician, head of this curious organization, the World Federation of Right to Die Societies, even recognizes how we're having to strain the language. Uh, he says, I always refrain from using the term killing. You terminate life and actually more than that, you." terminate the suffering. Get used to that idea because it is counterhuman a little bit, uh, as indeed it is. Here's a 
doctor at the bedside of this elderly man who says, my grandkids came to visit. They talked mostly about world politics, kept asking me how I felt about the youth in Asia. Uh, you can really uh, play with language, uh, really to your heart's content. All right, let's uh, look at some of the data that uh, is informing our discussion here. Let, let me begin with my own country, uh, the United States, uh, to just bring you up to date about the situation here. Now, in the United States, we now have 10 jurisdictions uh, that have legalized uh, physician-assisted suicide uh, since 1997. Now, here in the United States, um, and by the way, you'll notice a, an acceleration of states coming on board with this since 2016. So uh, there have been uh, six just, uh, just in the last uh, four years, actually over the course of three years. Now here in the States, uh, we are talking about uh, what's called uh, physician-assisted suicide. Uh, that means uh, that uh, a physician writes a prescription to give a, a dose of uh, lethal medications, typically a box of barbiturates, uh, known uh, insidiously as a box of barbs uh, to a patient to take at the time and place of his or her own choosing. Perhaps they'll store it away in the closet for a while. Uh, hopefully their suicidal granddaughter doesn't uh, uh, come across it, uh, but it is self-administered. Uh, it is not uh, uh, euthanasia, which is killing a person by a lethal injection. So we do not have in that in the United States and uh, this is for terminal illnesses only, which are typically defined as uh, a, a death expected despite uh, treatments that may be available uh, within 12 months. Uh, although as in many jurisdictions that we'll talk about, people have the right to refuse treatments that could be available. So we have assisted suicide in the United States. And at this point, uh, there are no uh, uh, criteria in any of these states that would allow people with strictly mental illnesses to avail themselves of this. Now, uh, the first two states to have done this were Oregon and Washington, so we have uh, the most data about them. Uh, and here is some interesting data from uh, 2017 to 2018 from these two states. Uh, the top reasons, because patients are uh, interviewed as to why they want to have their box of barbs, and you can see here that uh, in both states, the common reasons why people are asking for this are because uh, they are fearful of losing autonomy. They're afraid that they will be unable to engage in activities due to their terminal illness. Remember, the states, it's terminal illnesses. They're afraid that their conditions will cause them to lose dignity or be a burden to their family. And as a matter of fact, the minority reason, the fewest patients, uh, are asking for this because they are currently experiencing pain. And by the way, those who are experiencing pain, we really have no idea from this survey whether or not they're availing themselves of state-of-the-art uh, palliative care, which uh, actually has come quite a long way in treating pain. But I want you to see that all of these reasons have in common uh, that they are uh, various forms of fear. And I, of course, want to own fear or anxiety is something that is very much in the wheelhouse of psychiatry. We understand fear. We understand how to minister to fear uh, and how to deploy resources uh, and provide hope and to mitigate fear. So in fact, the main reasons why people are wanting this in the United States is indeed on the basis of fear. Montaigne said, he who fears he shall suffer, already suffers what he fears. So uh, this uh, study back in uh, 2012 uh, was a very deep ethnographic study of people who were seeking assisted suicide. And they concluded the expression of the wish to hasten death in these patients is a response to overwhelming emotional distress and has different meanings, which do not necessarily imply a genuine wish to hasten one's death. Uh, again, when you probe these cases, you're discovering that what people are grappling with are uh, emotional issues that have to do with fear and anxiety. So the Oregon law, for example, 
uh, says that if in the opinion of an attending physician or consulting physician, a patient may be suffering from a psychiatric or psychological disorder, then they should refer the patient for counseling. So that means the evaluating physician who is typically not a psychiatrist, uh, if they think it's a psychiatric problem, they should refer to psychiatrists. But in fact, uh, how often does that get done? Well, when the first law first came online, first two years of it, people were fairly concerned about this. And uh, one out of every three patients was referred for psychiatric evaluation. But you can see subsequently in the subsequent years, almost nobody is getting referred for psychiatric evaluation. And uh, in the United States, and frankly, in most jurisdiction, there is no requirement whatsoever for people to be referred to a mental health professional in order to diagnose them, uh, work with them, uh, deploy the skills that we have in our armamentarium. It's optional. Uh, it's up to the uh, ref uh, initial evaluating physicians. And you can see, at least in, in Oregon, uh, how infrequently that now occurs. Uh, here was an interesting study uh, that asked uh, for uh, the advocacy organization that pushes, pushed and advocates the United States for assisted suicide to give them a number of cases to study. So that organization gave what they felt were the best cases of people who had been given their box of barbs, 58 patients. Uh, those 58 patients were studied by this uh, independent group of uh, psychiatrists uh, and 31% were found to have clinical de uh, depression that had not been identified by their primary physician who evaluated them, approved, and wrote the prescriptions for the box of barbs. Uh, so you can see how often that's being missed. Uh, now, the patients were told uh, that they felt that they had a treatable uh, clinical depression. Seven patients who were told that said, yeah, I know, but I don't think it has anything to do with my desire to die. In other words, their suicidal feelings. They offered all 15 patients uh, free psychiatric treatment uh, to see if they might be able to mitigate that depression. Only one person accepted that. All right, let's move on to Canada. Uh, having covered some basics about the US. In Canada, medical aid in dying made, uh, another uh, euphemism. Uh, in Canada, unlike the United States, as you all know, it's primarily euthanasia, death by a lethal injection, predominantly, well over 95% of cases. Because in any jurisdiction where you give both youth option for euthanasia and for assisted suicide, everybody would much prefer to outsource the procedure to their doctor to get a lethal injection rather than to have to take hundreds of barbiturates. Uh, and we can, we're gonna talk a little bit more about the moral outsourcing of that. Now, as many of you in Canada know that uh, the so-called C-14 law in 2016 uh, de defined a unique Canadian term, the idea of people whose death was in the reasonably foreseeable future. Uh, that was generally felt to be associated somehow with terminal illness. Again, it's a unique term. There's no other country that talks about death in the reasonably foreseeable future. It was never defined as to what that means, unlike in the U.S., where they talk about terminal illness and the window of 12 months. Uh, however, also the criteria for euthanasia became conditions that were intolerable to the person suffering from them and considered untreatable. However, it is very important to know that the patient, of course, gets the primary vote as to whether he or she can tolerate their uh, condition that's made death in the reasonably foreseeable future imminent, but also consistent actually with the state of the art of medical ethics, people are allowed to refuse treatments. You know, if you don't want hemodialysis, if you don't want the chemotherapy, uh, that is your prerogative. So untreatable uh, meant treatments that were acceptable to the patient. So the patient gets to weigh in on both whether the condition is intolerable, intolerable or untreatable. So uh, this really started uh, out in 2016 and it really took off. You can see the percentage increase uh, in the first several years. It's been slowing down. Uh, but nevertheless, as of October of this year, over 19,000 people have died at the sharp end of a physician's needle in Canada. That's two out of every hundred Canadians now die by lethal injection from their physicians. 
Now, the question is, what about psychiatric patients? Now, uh, from the get-go, uh, psychiatric conditions were excluded, and the Council of Canadian Academies was asked to look uh, after the law was established at further modifications of the law, and they came back with a conclusion in December 2018 regarding people with mental illness. They said it may be difficult for a clinician to distinguish between a capable person who's making an autonomous decision for MAID and a person whose pathological desire to die is a symptom of their mental disorder that impairs the decision-making. Further down, furthermore, there's some evidence that some people who have sought psychiatric euthanasia and assisted suicide in jurisdictions that permit it share certain characteristics with people who attempt suicide. So as a result of their study, they have recommended that Canada exclude people with mental disorders. And especially back when we were talking about death in the reasonably foreseeable future, that in itself also kind of pushed aside most uh, mental illnesses in which we don't tend to think of people as terminally ill. We'll get to that point a little bit later. Yet, people in Canada continue to push for the inclusion of the mentally ill. For example, the British Columbia Civil Liberties Association says that excluding patients uh, who have mental illnesses from this would have the perverse result of leaving such patients with no options, but other to continually suffer intolerably. So they have been pushing for the inclusion of the mentally ill, a certain aspect of psychiatric disorders, dementia, the Dementia Advocacy of Canada Association has been pushing in Canada for the inclusion of the mentally ill. And then comes the Truchon case, uh, the infamous Truchon case that many Canadians are familiar with. Uh, this was a case that uh, in which a chronically non-terminally ill a couple of uh, uh, plaintiffs went to the court in Quebec uh, and the court, uh, they complained that they were being excluded from the privilege, uh, as they saw it, of euthanasia in Canada because they were not, uh, their illness was not uh, one that where death was reasonably foreseeable. So uh, the court uh, felt that that was discriminatory and said that at least as far as Quebec went, uh, they invalidated that concept. Uh, and uh, way led on to way, it was uh, not appeal, the government didn't object, and it found its way into uh, the now pending C7 law in Canada, which is seeking to amend the current euthanasia law there, the made law, and extend it. And in this new version that has now been reintroduced after a hiatus, uh, we uh, are seeing that uh, they are repealing the limitation that to be eligible, your death has to be in the reasonably foreseeable future. That opens it up to the chronically ill, to people with serious and incurable illness or disability. However, it says for that purposes of this eligibility, a mental illness is not a serious and incurable illness disease or disability. So we're excluding mental illnesses, says the C7 laws. However, uh, still maintaining uh, a position that uh, was originally established, and that is when it comes to suffering, remember the intolerable suffering, when it comes to suffering, that psychological suffering is just as salient, just as eligible for this as physical suffering. So the door remains open that psychological suffering is a cause. So whether or not you wanna call psychological suffering a mental illness or not uh, is really uh, perhaps a, a, a distinction without a difference and something which I'll come back to that is, is not such a significant difference in terms of our skill sets as mental health professionals. Uh, now, Mark, I, I don't want to throw off your pace, but is there a way to define mental illness? Well, is there a clean I, definition? Yeah, no, as a matter of fact, that's a whole lecture in its own right. There is not a, a clean way of defining mental illness. And as a matter of fact, mental illness is uh, back to Humpty Dumpty, means whatever you want it to mean. Uh, and uh, does it mean uh, somebody who is disabled? Does it mean somebody who's on medication? Does it mean somebody who's been hospitalized? 
Does it mean any of the diagnoses in the so-called DSM? Does it only mean certain diagnoses in the DSM? Uh, does it mean only people who uh, are disabled by virtue of their suffering? It can mean many, many things. Basically, it means what you want it to mean. Uh, and that is actually part of the conundrum here. Right. So the, uh, the C14 law then is moving us away from terminal illness back into chronic illness. Now the Canadian Psychiatric Association has weighed in on this and I'm sad to say that unlike the American Psychiatric Association as we will soon see, uh, the CPA uh, has really uh, opened the door uh, and really has uh, gotten themselves caught up in the snare of parity, as we've long been preaching, mental illnesses and physical illness should be treated with the same degree of access and respect and uh, uh, have, have uh, no difference in their stigmatization. But the CPA has said patients with a psychiatric illness should not be discriminated against solely on the basis of their disability, which is an interesting word to choose, and should have available the same options regarding MAID as available to all patients. So even the psychiatric association there has opened the door. So whatever the C7 law may be saying, uh, the acknowledgement of this, uh, this statement by the CPA has set the stage, if not for the law, certainly for litigation, sort of true Sean 2.0 that is impending uh, after C7 passes, if it does pass. Now, in general, in Canada, Canadian psychiatrists, at this point, it's become, uh, by 2017, sufficiently normative that they approved of made for medical purposes, not so much for psychiatric purposes, although I do want to point out, as is the case with many polls, we can have a whole other lecture about the flaws of, of polling, uh, but only 21% of psychiatrists who were polled actually responded. Polls tend to favor those with extreme opinions one way or another. Here's a colleague in Canada who wrote to me and said, I'm in Canada and I have two patients who both have borderline personality disorder, which is one of the disorders in psychiatry that comes with chronic suicidal thinking. They're eagerly waiting for the mentally ill people to be included in MAID, writing letters to legislators, etc. Every session with me is, why are you making me suffer? They also talk about how it's approved in Belgium, I feel I can get nowhere in treatment as this is the topic every single time. So patients, uh, some patients are complaining that they're being psychiatric patients in Canada, that they're being prohibited uh, that from made, uh, that they're being discriminated against, they're being stigmatized and it's uh, hanging up the ability to move forward. And here in the United States, uh, many of us uh, have been approached by patients who want us to write a letter to uh, help to send to Dignitas in Switzerland, uh, which is doing psychiatric euthanasia, uh, and so often getting hung up on those kinds of debates. All right, let's actually move across the Atlantic now, and let's look at some of the lessons from the living laboratories of the Netherlands and Belgium. I want you to see what's happening there, not in theory, not uh, theoretical considerations of slippery slopes that you know we shouldn't be bringing into argumentation, but actual real data about what's been going on over there. So uh, in all these countries, these three countries in 2002, uh, long before uh, Canada, uh, they uh, entered this argument and did a couple of things. First, they effaced the difference between terminal and non-terminal illness. They got out of that conversation. They said, we're no longer interested in discriminating between people with terminal illnesses, non-terminal, reasonably foreseeable, and so forth. Also, uh, they were some of the first countries to say, we're now also not going to get uh, hung up on distinctions between physical and mental suffering. Suffering is suffering is suffering uh, and their equivalent. So. Uh, they instead replaced the distinction uh, of, treat of uh, terminal and non-terminal with conditions that were unbearable and untreatable. You can see now how the Canadian law was built on the template of the Benelux laws. Okay. So the question is, uh, 
are your conditions unbearable, again, as defined by the patient, and untreatable as defined both by the patient and the doctor. So that opened up the uh, conversation and ultimately when their law passed with these uh, parameters, uh, uh, we saw opening the door to the eligibility of people with psychiatric disorders and children and advanced directives uh, in those countries. And in those countries, it's almost exclusively euthanasia, not the box of barbs. All right, let's start by looking at the Netherlands. All right, so uh, in the Netherlands, uh, Things have really taken off since 2003. Uh, there's been a 350% increase in uh, euthanasia uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, so at this point, uh, almost 5% of every human being who dies in the Le Netherlands dies uh, at the hands of a physician injecting them with uh, a lethal injection. Uh, we actually believe in this New England Journal report that uh, there may be as many as 23% of the euthanasias that are unreported. So these numbers are likely to be even higher. Now, uh, with regard to yeah. psychiatric conditions, uh, we're seeing uh, in the Netherlands on the average of about one person per week uh, who has a, a psychiatric disorder, uh, about 1.2% of all euthanasias are psychiatric disorders. Now, the data that you see here excludes people with dementia. We'll see in a moment what the disorders are. Uh, I've kind of broken out dementia, although dementia certainly are in the domain and wheelhouse of psychiatry and mental health professionals, uh, they are uh, really have much different statistics. If you wanna add back in dementia, you can see it's quite considerably more people with dementia are being euthanized there each year. Um, now, just uh, here is uh, some data uh, over the course of three years from 2011 to 2014, and you can see some of the diagnoses of patients that are being euthanized on their on request. Uh, and by the way, sometimes with second opinions uh, that disagree with the first opinions, but in the Netherlands, that disagreement is non, the, the second opinion is non-binding. So many of these people were euthanized despite a second opinion disagreeing. I want to particularly call your attention to the 52% of people with personality disorders. Now, personality disorders are a curious aspect of what we deal with in mental illness. These are conditions that are more about uh, problematic and dysfunctional traits uh, than they are states. Uh, we sometimes in shorthand when teaching medical students, we say, uh, personality disorders are not so much about what you have as they are about who you are. Uh, there is good treatment for personality disorders. It tends to be psychotherapy. Of these people who had personality disorders, 28% of them, almost one out of three, have never had any psychotherapy. And yet, and yet, they were declared untreatable. And they were granted permission to and given lethal euthanasia. And 56% of patients, of these psychiatric patients refused one or more recommended treatments. Because remember in all of these contemporary uh, societies that respect autonomy, allow people to refuse treatment. And yet, even though there were recommended treatments that could have turned them around, they refused them and therefore were considered, quote, untreatable, and they were allowed to have euthanasia. And here is something that particularly runs me up the z-axis, and that is 73% of these patients were euthanized by their own treating psychiatrist. The very same psychiatrist who had been trying to prevent their suicides were, was providing their suicides. Now, in the Netherlands, they have an interesting additional approach, uh, they have this clinic, the Lievenzijnde Klinik, which literally means end of life clinics recently named to the softer term euthanasia expertise centers. These are traveling clinics uh, that go around the country. There are about 60 traveling teams. They will do an evaluation of patients because many people, uh, particularly people who want psychiatric euthanasia are often refused. So they go to these clinics to, for an independent evaluation. And in many cases, the patients are new to the uh, 
to the evaluators in this clinic. The typical evaluation is one to one and a half hours. And you can see over the course of the years, the percentage of the euthanasias in Netherlands that are being done by these mobile clinics. And I have data for 2016, the vast majority of the psychiatric euthanasias in the Netherlands were performed in this clinic. The opinions of Dutch citizens as the time has gone on by 2018, and they've been doing this for so many years that the societies were so besotted by this that 50% uh, of people were approving of psychiatric euthanasia, 40% for children, dementia, very popular, 70% of the population approves of it. Even 50% have said, we approve uh, the uh, demedicalization of euthanasia so that we think you don't even have to have a psychiatric diagnosis anymore. You should simply be, say, uh, be uh, able to say, I'm tired of living or I've completed my life. And there are now initiatives in the Dutch legislature by the D66 party uh, and several other uh, organizations, uh, uh, grassroots organizations that are pushing to extend their laws. I mean, you think Canada is you know, pushing to some uh, new and precarious territory. In the Netherlands, they're pushing for a completed life and tired of living. I'm gonna skip this for a second in the interest of time and move on to Belgium. In Belgium, they have now removed any uh, restriction on the lower age for children. As a matter of fact, three children were euthanized uh, in those years uh, that you can see. So in Belgium, uh, they've really taken off there. There's been a thousand percent increase uh, since this began back in 2002. 2.1% uh, of all human beings in Belgium now die at the sharp end of the physician's needle in the Flanders region, which is where this is especially acceptable. Uh, over 6% of people are being uh, uh, die by euthanasia. And another New England Journal study says that this may 40% may be underreported. With regard to psychiatric euthanasia, you can see how this has grown over the years. Interestingly, they pulled back a little bit. They were, they were so uh, gung-ho on psychiatric euthanasia in Belgium that some protests uh, have actually been somewhat successful at deploying the brakes uh, on this. So they pulled it back uh, a bit in 20, uh, 2019. Interestingly, the majority of these cases were women, were female. That can uh, open up some interesting discussions uh, as to why that might be, some interesting concerns about why that might be. So now. Mark, you might have noticed I wrote about that drop, and I think it actually had more to do with the fact that they were prosecuting for the death of the woman with autism, and it scared off many of the physicians who are normally involved with these types of uh, psychiatric euthanasias, uh, and that's why it dropped at that point, because that's before the court had heard the case. Yeah, I think that was some of the reasons, uh, but also I will tell you that, that there is indeed a, an increasingly effective rising protest movement uh, in Belgium, probably one of the more effective uh, pushbacks uh, that, that are exist in countries. So I think that there, there are multiple reasons for that, but you're quite right that that was one of them. Now, I want to show you this other statistic. If you just look in 2019 at cases where not that had psychiatric diagnoses, but cases where the primary reason was people saying, I'm suffering psychologically, not physically, but psychologically. If you just break out those statistics, that's quite a few additional people. Now, some of those people may be some of the 57. Uh, but not just the 57 who had official psychiatric diagnosis. So, uh, and uh, here shows you in 2019, uh, the diagnoses of those 57. Again, I wanna point out that the leading diagnosis was personality disorders. Once again, 45% of the total. And as a matter of fact, if you compare that to the entire three years, 2012 to 2015, in those entire three years, uh, they only had 20 personality disorders uh, out of a total of 88, uh, only 23%. So that's quite a difference from, uh, sorry, quite, quite a difference from uh, the 2019 data. We had 26 just in that one year alone. 
So the euthanasia of personality disorders, and remember the personality disorders, many of whom have not had psychotherapy, uh, has been growing. Now, uh, this is uh, the infamous Dr. Lee of Tienpont. She is responsible personally for doing 70% of the psychiatric euthanasias in Belgium. She wrote this book, Libera Me, Free Me, on euthanasia and psychological suffering. She says, I am a pioneer, so I am loved and I am hated. Uh, some of you may remember here in the United States, uh, uh, a couple of decades ago, we had a proponent of uh, assisted suicide that was rather infamous here in the United States named Jack Kevorkian. And I find it always a little bit uncanny, the physiognomic similarities uh, between these two. It seems to me, I don't know if you believe in reincarnation or not, uh, but uh, anyhow, that's... Uh, so here uh, is uh, Dr. Uh, Theon Pont's uh, 100 cases that she evaluated uh, and approved for euthanasia. I want to point out depression, that is not quite surprising, but again, one of the most common, uh, uh, most, one of the most common diagnoses was personality disorders, half of which were this construct of borderline personality disorder, which again, are people who struggle with very chronic suicidality, suicidal feelings as a way of coping with distress and often engage in self-harm, suicide attempts, and so forth. For uh, many years, for 200 years, uh, there's been a Catholic organization in uh, a, a group of uh, brothers called the Brothers of Charity in Belgium. They, their mission is psychiatric treatment. They run uh, the majority of psychiatric inpatient units in Belgium. Uh, they have over 5,000 psychiatric beds and a number of outpatient facilities. Now, as you might well imagine, as a Catholic order, uh, for the first 15 years of uh, euthanasia in Belgium and psychiatric euthanasia, they were saying, not in our facilities, we're Catholics, we're not going to be offering that option to our patients. Well, Ladies and gentlemen, so besotted is the Belgian society, so penetrated by this changing new normative value, this what Robert J. Lifton, the famous uh, Nazi doctor's expert has called malignant normality that has emerged, uh, that it has percolated into and penetrated the Brothers of Charity so that in 2017, they announced that they too, in their Catholic hospitals, would allow euthanasia to take place in their facilities. Well, as you might imagine, the Pope was not happy about this. Matter of fact, <coughs> excuse me, the Vatican convened a conference in a, a, a year ago of the three major Abrahamic religions. Uh, and uh, this conference declared to the world uh, that any form of euthanasia should be forbidden without exceptions make a long story short, currently the Vatican is asking the Brothers of Charity to remove any designation or association with the Catholic Church from their many psychiatric hospitals if they insist on going ahead and joining the rest of the secular and many people describe it as post-Catholic Belgian society in providing euthanasia for their psychiatric patients. Okay. So now let's delve into uh, some of the ethical issues as I see it. Uh, well, the way I see it, unethical ethics are better than no ethics at all. So uh, I wanna take you back in history to the origins of medicine, to the roots of the mighty tree of medicine. Now in uh, ancient Greek mythology, Medusa, who remember was that goddess who could turn you to stone by looking at her and had hair made of snakes. Uh, that uh, she, her blood was considered uh, extraordinarily powerful. And the goddess Athena went, says the legend, says the myth, to draw Medusa's blood. Out of the left side of uh, her neck was a deadly poison. That blood could do tremendous harm. Out of the right side of her neck was a life-giving elixir. She gave both of these vials to the goddess Asclepius, who was the god of healing in, in ancient Greece. Uh, and the acknowledgement was that medicine uh, could hurt and harm. And in ancient Greece, it was the practice in 
the ancient hospitals, which were called Asclepia, as they were dedicated to the god Asclepius, uh, to practice euthanasia. That was a common technique in ancient Greece uh, in where we had actually very little effective treatment uh, to give uh, poison uh, sometimes as the way of putting patients out of their suffering. With one exception, one of the Asclepion chose the blood from only one side of Athena's neck, and that was the Asclepion of Hippocrates. In Hippocrates, Asclepia was unique. Not only did they do what we would now call evidence-based medicine based on keen observation, but they established something very unique. They established a so-called covenantal community, a community in which you had to subscribe or profess, hence the origin of the word profession, you had to profess a set of values. And, uh, and to join that as a student, uh, as a practitioner, you had to agree to certain uh, principles, certain moral principles. And that made it distinct from all other Asclepia. And one of those distinct moral principles uh, was that you would not engage in euthanasia. And in fact, you had to take an oath in which you stated those principles, an oath which we now call the Hippocratic Oath. And that Hippocratic Oath included the statement, I will not give a fatal drug to anyone if I am asked, neither will I counsel any man to do so. Well, as Margaret Mead wrote, the followers of Hippocrates were dedicated completely to life under all circumstances, regardless of rank, age, or intellect. This life of a slave, emperor, foreign man, defective child, this is a priceless legacy which we cannot afford to tarnish, but society has repeatedly attempted to make the physician into the killer. It is the duty of society to protect the physicians from such requests, and physicians have been attempt attempting to protect themselves from such requests as they have traveled and traversed through history through a number of societies. Matter of fact, here in the United States, one of our founding fathers of not just psychiatry, but the constitutions uh, and the Declaration of Independence, he wrote, the constitution of a republic should make a special privilege for medicine's freedom, as well as religion's freedom. So for us to evince and articulate our own code, our own oaths, and not killing patients has been in that code. There's a distinction in law between so-called malum in se and malum prohibitum. Malum in se is something that's bad in its own right, as opposed to a malum prohibitum, which is bad simply because society and the law of that particular local jurisdiction or culture has said that it's bad. And this demonstrates that law and ethics are not the same. There was a time where the Holocaust was legal and hiding Jews was criminalized. Slavery was legal, but freeing slaves was criminalized. Segregation was legal, legal and prosecuting racism was criminalized. Uh, so uh, in medicine has always considered killing your patient malum in se, even though many societies historically we don't have to go further back than thinking about the programs in uh, Nazi Germany for T4. And now the emerging change uh, in uh, the removal of the malum prohibitum of euthanasia uh, that we in medicine have considered and I still consider we profess that killing a patient is malum inse. And we profess it both informally and formally. Our medical organizations, the American Medical Association says physician-assisted suicide and euthanasia is fundamentally incompatible with the physician's role as healer. This has been debated uh, and twice reaffirmed by the Council on Ethics. The Ethics Committee of the AMA has done a deep dive into uh, this with testimony, with studying scholarly paper, papers and has twice, the AMA has reaffirmed this official position. Similarly, the World Medical Association, I've been somewhat involved with holding the, the line here, said that assisted suicide and euthanasia is unethical and must be condemned by the medical profession and the physician who kills their patient acts unethically. Uh, and the World Medical Association has twice, most lately of October of last year, reaffirmed this position. The World Psychiatric Association is a little bit less emphatic about it. It says 
that the psychiatrists should be careful of actions that could lead to the death of those who can't protect themselves because of their disability. The psychiatrist should be aware that the views of the patients may be distorted by mental illness, such as depression. In my opinion, that is not sufficient. And therefore I and several others, including uh, Dr. Annette Hansen, who's spoken to the EPC on a number of occasions, crafted and were able to pass uh, this statement by the American Psychiatric Association uh, back in 2016, that a psychiatrist should not prescribe or administer any intervention to a non-terminally ill person for the purpose of causing death. Now, that does not mean the American Psychiatric Association endorses doing it for terminally ill. We actually hold with the AMA. We keep our ethics uh, in congruence with the American Medical Association, but we felt a special statement needed to be broadcast particularly to Belgium and the Netherlands and any other country that is contemplating, including psychiatric patients, uh, to uh, make it clear that we do not think that is an ethical practice. Unfortunately, the Canadian Psychiatric Association does not agree with us, uh, as we saw before earlier, that psychiatric patients should not be discriminated against uh, and that made should be made available to them. Now, what is the arguments that are made in favor of letting this uh, be available to psychiatric patients? Well, the idea is, as many countries have said, as we psychiatrists have said, there's a parity between mental suffering and physical suffering, and that just because you have a mental illness doesn't mean you're incompetent, uh, and that there can still be something as called rational suicide, uh, for psychiatric patients and that it is stigmatizing to exclude any class of people to say some people are allowed suicide and other people we're going to prohibit from suicide. Uh, the argument goes on further to say that for some psychiatric patients suicide is inevitable so they need a more certain and safer alternative uh, rather than uh, maiming themselves with suicide attempts that families will be less shocked that they have an option to be a deterrent uh, and which has actually been disproven and that many psychiatric cases are truly futile and untreatable. Well, let me address that issue about futility. Uh, the claims of futility, uh, I think, fall apart uh, for four main reasons. One is unpredictable diagnoses, unpredictable prognoses, the inaccessibility of manpower, time, money, and, and the problem of stigma and treatment diversity. With regard to unpredictable diagnoses, in order to be able to say whether something is truly untreatable, you got to know what you're dealing with. What is the diagnosis? In fact, in psychiatry, we do not have very good reliability about our diagnoses. Our reliable, about 66 to 76 percent of patients, uh, we have reliability. For the rest, that's almost uh, two th uh, a third of patients. The diagnosis keeps changing because we do not have another domain of validation for our diagnosis. So the diagnosis now it's schizophrenia, it's schizoaffective. No, no, it's bipolar disorder. Now, you know, there are more personality disorder elements. So once you have diagnostic fluidity, then that means prognostic fluidity. So that really calls into question the whole idea of whether you can truly say uh, that a treat illness is uh, untreatable if you don't really have a firm handle on whether this illness is a reliable diagnosis. I'm going to skip that and go to futility. Uh, the fact of the matter is because of that, the science of prognosis in psychiatry is really squirrely. It's not very well developed. A number of articles, this is just one of them, has come out to show that diagnostic uh, uh, fluidity leads to prognostic fluidity. Uh, we just are not very good at predicting what the future brings, even if we think we have the right diagnosis. Uh, the past president of the Canadian Psychiatric Association said an extensive review of the literature shows we cannot predict irremediability when it comes to mental illness. To dismiss this using a false equivalent that nothing is 100% certain in medicine, so there's nothing different for mental illness, would be wrong. There's a big difference between being able to predict the declining course of a well-known medical ailment with understood biology, 
even if not with 100% certainty, versus making unpredictable assessments about the course of mental illnesses. One of the main tasks of the therapist is not to accept the person's distorted thoughts and their wish to die, but instead to keep hope when the patient has lost it. The prognosis is uncertain, not only because of the nature of psychiatric diagnosis, but also because the likelihood of improvement is dependent on the hope and improvement. So if you begin to lose hope with the patient, that infects the patient. Another problem with futility is in psychiatry, we have a real problem compared to other specialties. We don't have enough of us to go around. There's insufficient manpower. There's often not enough time to treat patients. There's not enough money to cover the time that it takes to treat patients. That people don't show up for treatment, not uh, because they think that it's futile, but because they feel stigmatized and embarrassed by it. As a matter of fact, the World Health Organization says the number one cause of inadequate recovery for mental health disorders is what? Due to inadequate finances, due to inadequate treatment facilities, and due to inadequate treatment manpower. Finally, the futility comes from the fact that there are huge numbers of paths to treatment because mental illness is such a diverse set of problems. There are a huge number of different kinds of interventions that are available to us in psychiatric treatment that lead us, uh, can lead us in numerous different directions, some of them very expensive directions, some of them very time-consuming directions, uh, some of them, uh, uh, despite the fact that they work incredibly well, such as electroconvulsive therapy, patients are reluctant to have because Hollywood has scared them away by showing them how the treatment was administered in 1942, uh, not in 2020, uh, and so forth. Before we try assisted suicide, Mrs. Rose, let's give the aspirin a chance. A lot of treatments. I'm going to skip these next uh, couple of slides uh, because we are uh, coming down to the end of the wire. But I do want to say that uh, this one of our most famous psychiatrists in America who reminds us that it is doctors who ultimately get to decide whether a patient is eligible or not. In that sense, it's kind of pseudo autonomy because the doctors remain the gatekeepers. Uh, this very, very uh, seasoned psychiatrist says, decisions made by medical professionals can never be entirely free of what we would call counter-transference issues. In other words, our own feelings. The doctor's own anxiety in the face of death, exhaustion, and hopelessness, and even the hatred of the patient who does not want treatment or will not allow the doctor to be helpful can influence a supposedly scientific or rational decision. Now, I want to say one quick word here. Mark, yeah. don't worry, I'm not cutting off the presentation. Uh, I know we're at about an hour, but that's fine. I, I, I don't right. think rushing is going to help you in this case. All right, thank you. So, so and I think no one's no one's leaving yet. So I mean, okay. continue. All right, we're, we're coming into the home stretch then. Thank you. I pre appreciate that reassurance. I'll slow down just a little bit. So one of the arguments uh, about uh, this is the idea that uh, it's possible that by providing the alternative, you, you know, <laughs> the alternative of euthanasia. Uh, that uh, we will somehow prevent suicides uh, and we uh, might give people at least knowing that that option is in the back pocket. We can lead them to the edge of the cliff and have them peer over the edge of the cliff, uh, but not necessarily have to go there, just know that they could jump if they wanted to with the help of their doctor, uh, that somehow that will mitigate their suicide. And as a matter of fact, interestingly, when I was... Uh, lecturing, uh, interestingly, to the uh, Brothers of Charity that I told you about earlier in Belgium, who opened up their Catholic facilities to uh, psychiatric euthanasia, uh, uh, I was uh, met a number of uh, patients over there in Belgium who told me that uh, they discovered that uh, the best kind of treatment to access a higher level of treatment, a much more intensive therapeutic intent and more services would be to actually ask for euthanasia. Because once they asked for euthanasia, 
Then in an, to when they went through the evaluation process, uh, people would gather around them and naturally in an attempt to see if there were any other thing they could offer them, suddenly doors were opened to treatment options that hadn't been available to them before. So in many ways, it was kind of a trump card. I don't know, in the United States, are we still allowed to use that word? Anyhow, a trump card uh, to, uh, to be able to get more psychiatric services. So ironically, uh, euthanasia became for many patients an opportunity to get better psychiatric treatment. But the claim was that it would possibly deter people from psychiatric treatment. But the worry has been whether or not psych, uh, allowing one sector of the population to have access to suicide would remove a moral barrier and send an implicit message that there are some people for whom suicide is okay. And there's been a worry as to whether or not that would percolate into the rest of the population to remove the obstacle uh, of moral approbation or moral inhibition to suicide. So this work by uh, Theo Bohr, uh, who is a philosopher in, uh, and uh, used to be early on a supporter of euthanasia in the Netherlands, and was part of the review boards and that work actually turned him against euthanasia uh, in, uh, in the Netherlands, uh, has gotten this data. This part of this uh, was what turned him against it. So this data shows so-called ordinary suicides uh, in the surrounding countries that neighbor the Netherlands, Finland, France, <laughs> Germany, and Denmark. Uh, so these are suicides of, you know, psychiatric patients, the kind that we're all trying to prevent. Although frankly, as you've uh, already heard me say, I think we should be trying to prevent them all. Uh, but this shows you that uh, over the course of several years, there were declines in suicide rates in these countries. But in the Netherlands from 2002 to 2015, uh, after uh, the first couple of years as the uh, euthanasia accelerated in the Netherlands, their so-called ordinary suicide rate began to climb. The only country in Western Europe where the suicide rates began to climb, a 20% increase in, uh, this is in Northern Europe, a 20% assisted in, uh, increase in un so-called unassisted suicide, larger increase than any other nearby countries. None of those other countries had euthanasia. So this seems to suggest, correlation is not causation, of course, but this seems to suggest that uh, there may indeed be a suicide contagion phenomenon uh, in countries that have designated a privileged class of people who are eligible for suicide. Uh, whereas uh, the rest of society is not eligible for suicide. We see similar correlation data in Oregon, in the United States. Uh, over the course of these 10 years that you see there uh, in this patient population, uh, in the United States at large, there was a 28% increase in so-called unassisted or ordinary suicide, uh, wild type suicide, if you will. But in Oregon, uh, we uh, saw an, uh, basically a 50% increase, which is 75% higher than in the rest of the country. Again, a strong suggestion uh, that not only did the Oregon law not create some sort of a stain hand against suicide, but may indeed have spread a contagion of suicide because this boundary, this fulcrum that balances uh, so-called acceptable suicide from unacceptable suicide, you know, has shifted. And as a result, uh, you, by, by medicalizing suicide, by outsourcing suicide to physicians, you are also morally outsourcing suicide, don't you see? You're actually uh, saying that, okay, it's not okay for me to do it or for people to do it themselves. If there's gonna be suicide in this society, it's gonna be a doctor who provides the chemical gun uh, 
that allows people to shoot themselves or rolls up your sleeve and gives you an injection. And I call that uh, moral outsourcing. I actually don't think I invented that term. Uh, may have actually picked up that term. As a matter of fact, Alex from a uh, 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 lecture that I heard uh, through the EPC. And I, and I wanna really underscore this because we in psychiatry, you know, we try to prevent suicides, right? We try to prevent them on an individual basis, on a case by case basis. And we are working on a public health level with all sorts of public health messaging and all sorts of programs and organizations and so forth to prevent suicide. So this is something obviously we think a lot about and we're engaged in uh, all the time. And as uh, we do this, we are looking for all of the ways, uh, all of the barriers uh, to people uh, having uh, uh, a facilitated pathway to suicide. And I have to tell you that although we certainly don't want stigma against those who have attempted suicide or committed suicide, we also need, we absolutely need the, the morality argument as well, that it's not okay, uh, that it's, it's, it, 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 sh it should be something that is considered unacceptable, unacceptable, undesirable. Uh, and when you remove that, and I really want to maintain that uh, when societies institute these laws, and particularly when they percolate into the mental health domain and mental health professionals, uh, that you are divesting yourself of that uh, moral barrier that is actually very important uh, at, uh, at the prevention of suicide. So uh, this uh, physician, actually famous tuberculosis physician, uh, this quote is often misattributed to other much more famous people, but he said, the job of the physician is threefold, to cure sometimes, to relieve often, and to comfort always. Uh, and I would add a fourth to that, uh, that has certainly been de facto the nature of medicine, which is to kill never. So to comfort always is important because if you think about the word compassion, the word compassion literally means to suffer with, to suffer alongside. And that is, I consider a, a sacred duty of physicians, a fundamental ethos of physicians in general, and especially psychiatrists, because we psychiatrists you know, deal with some of the most fundamental aspects of what it means to be a human being, the psyche, the soul. Uh, we deal with uh, aspects of mental life that uh, we don't share uh, at all or share much with the animals. I actually tell medical students uh, who I'm trying to in, uh, influence and inspire to come into psychiatry, you should come into psychiatry because it's the least veterinary uh, specialty of psychiatry. Uh, we are dealing with things that are most human uh, and least like other members of the animal kingdom. So uh, this is, so we suffer along with patients and we treat our patients for a long, long time. So we take the journey of calm passion with them. The psychiatrist's therapeutic role is to be a container of anguished, despairing, and hopeless emotions of a demoralized or depressed patient. And as such, he or she waits for an opportunity to instill hope and encouragement back into such a person. So we in psychiatry, we deal with the brain, yes. We deal with the mind, yes. And I want to be able to, to share with you, we deal with the heart, with the psyche, with the spirit. We are very much uh, in the mental health professions in general, but especially psychiatry where we have all of these domains. Uh, we are the most holistic of all physicians. And uh, I want to point out to you that we are not necessarily strictly interested in the so-called psychiatric disorders uh, that live under between the covers of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Mental Disorders. We're interested in the broader universe of psychological distress. 
the stress that comes from what's happening in your marriage, the distress that's what's happening between you and your children on your job, how you're feeling about the COVID-19. Uh, psychological distress is our wheelhouse, a subset of which is psychiatric disorder. So as a result, we're not just treating symptoms, we're not just uh, treating disorders, we're not just treating uh, uh, um, impairments and disabilities, uh, we're also trying to instill hope, uh, work towards well-being, grapple with meaning, and try to achieve flourishing uh, in our patients. And as such, these practices of euthanasia and assisted suicide for psychiatrists invert the fundamental ethos of who we are and what we do. The fundamental ethos of psychiatry, we prevent suicide not provide it. This is our core fundamental mission that defines our profession, has defined it all along, that is inherent in our culture, in the ethos, and what we profess as who we are and what we do. We ameliorate suffering as best we can, and we do that with a variety of approaches that include talk therapies and somatic therapies and medication therapies and listening and suffering with. We provide coping mechanisms for demoralization and discouragement and all of those fears that I spoke to you about back when we were looking at the data from Oregon and Washington uh, in terms of uh, what drives people uh, to seek uh, getting one of these chemical guns prescribed for them. We seek to understand the context of suffering uh, and the psychosocial context, the family context, the various forces that are coercing the patient, emotionally coercing, other forms of coercion, we help to find paths to a better future. That is our job. And indeed, we can't always ameliorate all suffering. Uh, remember, uh, cure sometimes, uh, relieve often, uh, but we can't always do that. And what's left, we can actually help people sometimes make meaning of their suffering. We have those skills for listening, deepening, accompanying them on their journey, for mobilizing their support systems. There are many actually evidence-based therapies for people who are chronically ill, terminally ill. Uh, it was Kubler-Ross herself who said, we're always amazed how one session of treatment can relieve a patient of a tremendous burden. It often requires nothing more but an open question. And of course, none of these laws require any person seeking assisted suicide or euthanasia to sit with anybody who has the skills or deploys evidence-based therapies that are now finding their way into the palliative care world like dignity therapy or meaning-centered therapy, just to show you two specific examples. So we go back to Hippocrates uh, who was at the root, uh, the Hippocratic Asclepian of the mighty tree out of which the boards of the house of medicine uh, were built over the subsequent couple of centuries uh, as various civilizations have come and gone and medicine has professed its ethos uh, in a steady voice through all those fluctuating uh, vicissitudes of so-called sometimes uh, questionably civilized societies. And Hippocrates said, some patients throw conscious that their condition is perilous, improve their health and outlook simply through their contentment with the goodness of the physician, that physician that stands by the bedside, that physician who promises to suffer with them and relieve their suffering with as much uh, as modern technology permits, and it permits quite a bit, ladies and gentlemen, uh, but is not going to do it by killing the sufferer. Just as the Pope should not perform abortions and the Dalai Lama should not take up arms, a psychiatrist should not counsel or abet suicide. For in doing so, we have misunderstood and betrayed our vocation and profession. Validation of suicide or assisted suicide by psychiatrists is therapeutic and professional hypocrisies. And I will end with a statement from my own mentor, Paul McHugh, the former chair of psychiatry at Hopkins, my teacher, who wrote back in the Kevorkian days, 
patients are seduced by isolating them, sustain their, sustaining their despair, revoking alternatives, stressing examples of others choosing to die, and sweetening the deadly poison by speaking of death with dignity. If even psychiatrists succumb to this complicity with death, what can be expected of the lay public? As Winston Churchill said, never give up, never, never, never. Thank you very much. I do have a question for, I have a couple questions, but uh, uh, this is one from uh, Dr. Tang and she wanted you to comment on uh, how can psychiatrists protect patients from their suicidal urges when the current legislation allows, uh, uh, currently, uh, that you're, um, for example, hospitalizing patients against their will because they have threatened to kill themselves, but now the hospitals that are supposed to treat them are also facilitating their deaths. It seems that there's no recourse to the legal protections that are, they currently use to protect suicidal patients from their own urges to destroy their lives. And well, she says, so you might want to comment on that. She made a few more comments. So I don't understand how society can expect psychiatrists to prevent suicide if they're asked to facilitate them simultaneously. Well, uh, I, you know, in a way, that's almost a rhetorical question. Uh, I think uh, res ipsa loquitur it speaks for itself. Uh, I think it's very important, and you know, I, the position of the American Psychiatric Association uh, supporting this idea about who we are, what we do. I think that we psychiatrists can need to continue doing what we're doing. When patients come knock, knock, knock uh, on our door, uh, I think that patients need to expect, and we need to expect our, ourselves that we will do our thing, uh, as they used to say in the 60s. Uh, we will continue to do our thing. We will continue to deploy uh, our know-how to try and relieve suffering, to help them find the path to a better future, to move them away from suicide rather than toward suicide, let alone uh, to provide suicide for them. Uh, in fact, you know, it's not very popular in medical ethics to talk about what the obligations of patients are to doctors. It's all much more fashionable and certainly important. I don't want to diminish the importance of talking about doctors' obligations to their patient. But frankly, I think that there are some unethical behaviors on the part of patients. And I actually think a patient coming to a psychiatrist, actually any physician, frankly, but in particular, a psychiatrist, and asking the psychiatrist to help them to commit suicide or help facilitate the journey towards somebody that can help them to commit suicide, I actually think that is an unethical act to, uh, on the part of a patient. A l'appel d'autre in French, you know, asking of the other. Uh, to put the other in, you know, an, an ethically compromised position. So I think the best that I can say is, um, is you know, there, there's a lot of talk in Canada about conscientious objection, and that's a whole other discussion that I left out tonight, and I'm sure you'll have other uh, talks on conscientious objection there. I, I actually uh, uh, want to promote the idea, not that psychiatrists should be practicing conscientious objection. I think that psychiatrists should be practicing good psychiatry. And I think good psychiatry is to prevent suicide, not provide suicide. And I do think that it is very vitally important for our professional organizations to back us up in that, which is why I and my colleagues have mobilized the American Psychiatric Association to back us up in that. I think the Canadian Psychiatric Association has disappointingly failed to do that. The Canadian Medical Organization uh, the, the Dutch and Belgian medical organizations. Uh, for those of you who don't know, by the way, I told you about the World Medical Association's uh, stance against euthanasia. Uh, the Dutch, Belgian, and Canadian uh, uh, medical societies have resigned from the World Medical Association uh, because of this stance. You know, those are the three countries uh, that have been uh, most uh, deploying euthanasia of uh, any countries in the world. Uh, and lo and behold, they have resigned from the international uh, family of medicine that have disagreed with them. So uh, just to let you guys know that uh, those three countries are now considered rogue countries. 
in the world of medical ethics. Um, you know, in much the way that uh, there was a time that the world came to recognize that uh, Germany became a rogue country uh, in the international community due to what became a malignant normality in their country where they felt at the time that the front end of the Holocaust being, uh, of course, psychiatric patients. Uh, and as a matter of fact, the techniques for mass killing were actually developed by psychiatrists in the so-called T4 program that uh, they thought they were moral pioneers too. They thought they were relieving suffering. They felt that they were at the cutting edge of an en en enlightened, virtuous, pioneering new ideas. And now we look back and say, what were we thinking? And uh, I hope the day will come we will look back on what is happening now as what were we thinking. So Dr. Conrad has, uh, has given you his information if someone wants to email him for updates. Many of you get the updates from us already uh, from certainly our Euthanasia Prevention Coalition. If you don't, uh, well, you can say you don't want it, but uh, most people were just going to receive it because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add you to my email list and that you don't want to be there. You can tell me, which is fine. And, or you can always just say no, and that's fine. There's a lot of comments here, and I don't think we have time to deal with it all, but we have several people with disabilities on right now uh, on this event, event and, and, uh, and obviously speaking, it's a very interesting thing because um, the president of our organization, Amy Hasbrook, is a woman who's heavily, very involved with the Canadian Council, the Council of Canadians with Disabilities, and she was pointing out that um, people with disabilities have always recognized that mental illness is a form of disability. So when Bill C-7 said it's not a disability, that in fact it was uh, countering all the work that had been done by the disability community to ensure that people with mental illness were being treated properly as having a disability. Mark might want to comment on that. And then I think we should go to the end of the call. Anybody has any questions, they can email us. This uh, video will be available very soon and it'll be sent to everyone who signed up. Uh, similar to our other uh, events, uh, there was about 50 people who had joined us at the highest time, uh, and yet we had about 130 who had registered. So there's a, quite a few people who will receive the uh, link to this who will be happy to watch it because they didn't join us tonight, uh, but that's just usually how it works. Well, thank you. So, um, you know, we, we, we in medicine, you know, recognize that there are uh, not every condition that we treat is necessarily a disability, right? Uh, a disability has a very specific meaning in clinical medicine uh, that talks about not just an, an, an impairment in functioning, but an impairment in functioning that causes a, a significant limitation in what you can do with your life. Uh, so uh, not every person that I treat who is suffering is necessarily disabled. So. I, I want to have a broader view of this world of the people that we're that we're trying to help here as uh, just the disabled. I think the disabled is a subset uh, of people with that uh, with 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 suffering, uh, and many people actually uh, suffer quite a bit, despite the fact that they're quite functional. Uh, actually, some of my most fascinating patients to me. Uh, are those who are incredibly high functioning scientists, physicians, uh, attorneys, uh, business people. Uh, and yet when they come into my office, uh, they have some of the worst agonies uh, in, that they're going on internally inside of them. So those people most certainly are suffering, but they're not disabled. But I think the disability community has much to say and much leadership uh, that they can give and particularly uh, has much to say because the fear, remember the fear factor that we talked about uh, as uh, being ex an, an extremely important ingredient as to why people want these, uh, these procedures provided for them, uh, that you know, people fear becoming disabled, uh, becoming dependent uh, and moving into the kind of lives uh, that they consider not worth living. And I think the disability community has much to say about the, the, the dangers of labeling 
a sector of life as not worth living and, and making that sector then eligible for you know, a, a final exit, uh, for an exit strategy. And, uh, and particularly uh, the importance of allowing people to find the trajectory whereby they acquire a sense that life is worth living and that that is a journey. And one of the things that people in this build community have spoken to me a lot about is their concern about the rapidity uh, with which people can access these kinds of uh, procedures. You know, the waiting periods, which are getting shorter and shorter. And the C7 bill is, you know, proposing even shortening. And Oregon has recently, you know, shorting, shortening the waiting period. Uh, and they speak about when devastating things happen, uh, particularly to people that are, you know, not going to be killed by the devastating thing, uh, but uh, get an injury, for example, the, uh, that the, uh, the journey to finding a meaningful life, adapting to that, uh, is something that takes a, a really, really long time. One of the uh, classic cases uh, that some of you may be familiar with that we teach in courses on medical ethics uh, is the so-called Dax case. Uh, and the Dax case many, many years ago was a guy who had severe, severe third degree burns. Uh, and he was in the burn unit for uh, a couple of years. Uh, and that entire time uh, he was healing and he was uh, begging for most of that time to please kill me. And this was many, many years ago, long before any uh, contemporary euthanasia assisted suicide laws came about. Uh, and yet they worked with Dax, they healed Dax, they gave you know a, a hundreds of skin grafts and Dax who had been some kind of a laborer uh, went on uh, to become, go to law school and become an attorney and to specialize in disability law. Uh, and it took some years uh, for him to get there. Uh, and it's a classic case that there is indeed a protracted and careful uh, journey that people need to be given time to adapt to and reconstruct their lives anew uh, around their disabilities. So the idea of life not worth living uh, is uh, a, a very dangerous precedent in a very fast paced, fast moving society that is especially anxious to not only tell you, why should you be suffering? Why are you doing this to yourself? Uh, uh, but also, you know, why am I having to suffer with you? It's interesting, I have a colleague in Belgium whose uh, father uh, has, some kind of a, uh, a chronic illness and chose not to get euthanasia. Uh, and he found when he made his decision to not get euthanasia, that he began to lose the sympathy of his friends mm -hmm. uh, who said to him, uh, I guess in Belgium, uh, quit your belly aching. It's your choice. You chose to continue to have this life uh, and turn down euthanasia. So we're getting kind of tired of hearing you complain about it. Uh, this is how the ethos begins to shift. And it's insidious. Well, we're ending the night. And uh, I'm going to thank Dr. Conrad. I'm going to thank everyone who joined us. I have put on the chat that next Thursday, the Euthanasia Prevention Coalition is offering the uh, Fatal Flaws film for one day, the link to it for, at no cost. So anybody can just watch it online with the link and uh well hopefully that means more people will want to share it with others uh so that's what we're doing next thursday this was a fabulous presentation um and i and i think that this will go down as one of those presentations that people will watch for uh, many years to gain great information thank you dr comrade thank you and thank you for the privilege of letting me go over time and uh, letting me relax a little bit because there was so much i wanted to share with you